Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and author of the best-selling biblical thriller, The Codist, a story about what they could do with your DNA. You know, you got that 23andMe kit, you wanted to find out all about it, and there are tens of millions of people who have put their DNA into this database. And these databases are being hacked all over the world, and your information about your DNA may not seem like the same importance as your Social Security number or your driver's license number or any of that personal information, but there's one who wants your DNA. There's one who wants it so bad He'll do whatever he can to take that DNA and weaponize it to take you out if you're of a particular lineage. And that is the plot behind the CODIS, that the DNA of the Levitical priesthood, the ones who will call for Jesus' return, has a unique Y chromosome marker. It's a fascinating story of biblical truth, on sale now $2.99 on Kindle. Also, if you visit our webpage, ignitinganation.com, scroll to the bottom of the page to special offers. You'll see a cover of my latest book, The Seven Laws of, Ab of Abundant Living, Lessons Learned from the Tree of Life. Click on that picture of that cover. We'll give you a little block to give us your email address. We won't send you spam because spam's not kosher, but we will give you the first chapter of this book for free. It takes you on a journey in the Garden of Eden all the way to the River of Life in the book of Revelation of Lessons Learned from the Tree of Life. It's my pl pleasure to introduce you to our guest this morning, John Guderian, author of the Proverbs Management Handbook, A Christian Manager's Guide to Doing Business. John's an accomplished executive manager with experience ranging from church board member to vice president of manufacturing. He also co-authored a business novel, Lean 9001, Battle for the Arctic Rose. He lives with his wife and four children in Waterloo, Ontario, but he's coming to us today live from Texas. John, welcome to the program. Hey, thanks for having me. So, John, are you a Waterloo, Ontario native? Uh, Kitchener, uh, Kit Ontario, which is about five minutes south of Waterloo, but yeah, we've been in that general area uh, my entire life. So what was it like growing up there? You know, it's, it's funny that the Canada... Uh, our closest North American neighbor next to Mexico. I mean, we should, this is the, big, the largest border uh, America shares with the country. Uh, and I really think that Americans are quite uneducated about uh, Canada and, yeah. and the similarities and the differences uh, between Americans and uh, Canadians. Yeah, I mean... We're not that different. Um, we, uh, you know, benefit an awful lot, I think, from American policy and American initiatives. And um, I got to tell you, though, frankly, I like America better. Um, my wife and I were we're currently on a 48-state book tour of America, and uh, I would say the biggest contrast that we've noticed so far especially in the South, is uh, there's just so many more Christians, or at least people that are open about their faith, you know, and I just, I love that about America. Um, Canada is, you know, we're, we're much more multicultural, and, and that has a lot of benefits. Um, great restaurants, you know, all kinds of variety of food, and, and it's interesting, and we have lots of friends from different cultures, but um, Christianity has been watered down a lot more so, I think, than it has in, in the United States. And I just love, yeah, I just love that uh, people talk openly about God here. Well, Canada, of course, is more patterned after the Western European model because of them being part of, uh, formerly part of the British Empire. Sure. Uh, and it's a parliamentary uh, environment and if you were uh, a resident or a citizen of any of the British Empire countries you were able to get landed immigrant status into Canada uh, openly which includes India and Pakistan and many countries that we we uh, are dealing with border issues immigration issues in America 
Um, but Canada had a pretty open policy that if you were a part of any of the British protectorates or British colonies, uh, you were welcomed there in a particular status in Canada. So it became multicultural and reflects more of the values of Western Europe, which is the watered-down Christianity that uh, unfortunately is taking over. Uh, Absolutely. So if, if that's the case, how did you come to faith and what was the key influence in your life from a church perspective? Yeah. Well, my family history, uh, and it's interesting, I, I've actually documented my father's story, my grandfather's story. Uh, my great uncle wrote a book about the uh, village in um, is now Poland, but it was an ethnic German uh, city. And as far back as we know in the family history, it was a uh, very strong uh, Christian faith in, in our family, uh, very committed Christians. So I grew up in a Christian home, but, um, you know, I, I don't consider myself to have been a, a fully committed Christian until my mid 40s when I, I actually ran into a health crisis and. Uh, uh, without getting into all the details, uh, it was some heart issues, and uh, you know there I was uh, passing out on the floor, things going black, thinking I'm dying, and um, it suddenly occurred to me that you know I had not really done much for God in my life, and I felt a, a deep, deep sense of remorse, and. Um, begged for a second chance. Now, it t turned out it wasn't all that uh, big a deal. It was, um, you know, a somewhat benign condition that can be treated and, and so forth, and, and I'm all fine. But that was a turning point for me. And um, at that point, I, I got much more involved in the church. I joined the church board, I, um, and I started writing. I, I felt a, a calling to um, start writing things about Christianity. And, uh, you know, I was involved in a, in a management position and they say, you know, write what you know. And, uh, so that was one of my first books. It's interesting that, that, uh, it took a crisis, uh, to bring you to that critical crossroads that Jeremiah talks about, that when you come to the crossroads, choose the ancient path and there you'll find your peace. Mm -hmm. And, you know, every one of us are overcomers by the word of our testimony and the blood of the Lamb. So what, what you describe is quite often the way that people come uh, to faith. You, you came in your 40s. I came to faith in my mid-40s. Uh, mm -hmm. But I came out of a Jewish background. Uh, was, was this the just a personal struggle or was there... A church and people surrounding you that were kind of feeding into you or yeah it certainly both um, I, I would say you know my focus up until that time had been on my career uh, you know career was number one God was I, I would say family was probably number two we have four kids and uh, God was a pretty distant third um, but at the same time, I'm, I always say I'm, I'm very grateful for, you know, again, coming from a very devout family. My, my grandmother, who uh, she lived to 104, uh, just passed away recently. But uh, every day she would pray for every one of her grandkids. And I, I think it must have been about 50 that she had. And, uh, but she uh, faithfully, you know, prayed for hours every day. And uh, parents as well, and I'm sure that had a lot to do with it. You know, I'm very grateful for that health crisis, oddly enough, right? I mean, I think it's the best thing that happened to me because right. I need I needed to be shook up. In your career, were you exposed? Uh, you know, in the, in the workplace in America, uh, there are, uh, I worked for a company years ago where they had uh, Wednesday morning Bible study. Uh, I was also a senior executive with AT&T and with Hewlett Packard, and um, faith wasn't w wasn't a component part. Uh, it kind of all flew past me. Uh, 
and maybe that's because I was walled off because of my Jewish background to really anything that was gospel related. Uh, I never heard the gospel. No one ever approached me about the gospel. So, you know, religion wasn't really spoken of. What was your experience in uh, corporate Canada? In corporate Canada, um, it's very rare to have companies, at least my experience, that uh, have things like Bible studies or, or that talk openly about religion. Uh, it's, it's very much a taboo thing. Now, that's not everywhere. The company I currently work for, um, half the executive management are Christians, committed Christians. Um, we used to have Bible studies, then there was a change in ownership, and that's uh, no longer allowed. Um, but, uh, um, yeah, it's, it's um, not very common, not very common. So you come along, and uh, in your book, you talk about an encounter you had with another manager that encouraged you to start to read the Proverbs. Mm, yeah, that's actually what uh, sparked the um, the whole idea of writing the book. Is uh, it was actually an elder of our church, a very successful businessman. Um, he's now retired, but uh, he still uh, checks up on things. He's got 40 locations worldwide. Uh, he's doing very well. And uh, years ago, he gave a sermon at our church, and. Um, attributed the success of his business to the application of Proverbs um, to his day-to-day -day, uh, work. And he encouraged us to read a chapter of Proverbs every day. Um, you know, it's a very common thing I've found out, but um, there's 31 chapters and your average month has, you know, 30, 31 days. So every month you get through a chapter or through the book. And um, what amazed me. I started doing that. I would read it at work in the morning, um, uh, usually get things going, then sit down and, and read a chapter. And so you get through the entire book um, 12 times in a year. And then after two years, you're, you're through 24 and then 36. And I was finding what, what amazed me was that You've read it 36 times, and you're still getting something new out of it almost every time you read it. And I, I think that's it's due to a number of things. I think it's due to the fact that, um, you know, your, your situation is changing. You've got different circumstances, so it speaks to you in a different way. Um, but also the Holy Spirit is, I mean, it's a live book, right? And, and the Holy Spirit is, is speaking to you in that specific way situation through the verses and so yeah i started um eventually after a few years uh documenting my uh thoughts and uh then i thought well this could be a book and i, I compiled it and uh and uh you know did a bit of editing but uh that's that's basically uh how the book came to be so you take us on a journey through the proverbs and the practical application into management as, mm -hmm. as you began this process, was it you looking at what you did and tying it back to a proverb, or was it you reading the proverbs and modifying your management style to be more reflective of the teachings of King Solomon? And what impact did that have if it was that way? Right. Um, both, for sure. Um, I mean, there were things in there that really spoke to me. Um, I, you know, I've never had a severe anger management problem, but I think everybody has a little trouble controlling their anger from time to time. And uh, I mean, I have, um, you know, yeah, you get angry, you make a fool out of yourself sometimes, and. Um, one thing that I really learned from Proverbs was not to do that. You know, Solomon just talks over and over, repeats it so many times for emphasis about um, controlling your your temper, right? You're, if you don't, you're like a city with its walls down and, and, you know, you're running through it with a banner. I think he uses the word banner saying you're a fool, right? And um, so, uh, yeah, that, that kind of drove me to... 
um, do a bit of research, read some books um, on how to actually effectively control your anger. And I've, I've documented that in the book, uh, some steps uh, that, that have proven to be very effective. But uh, so, but I, I would say what really, I, um, it, it was a bit of an epiphany to me um, that uh, that that was a, an issue that that I needed to work on, um, and uh, but um, yeah, otherwise, um, the first part of your question. Sorry, can you repeat that one? Well, did you find yourself trying to examine your own management style yeah. uh, against the management style, if you will, of King Solomon and the wisdom that he espoused, and adjust? your management style to more line up with the content of the Proverbs. And if you did that, uh, what was the outcome? Right. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, in, in, you know, many respects. Uh, I mean, the other thing that um, Solomon talks a, a lot about is encouraging people, right? The importance of encouraging people. And... Um, you know, he has a verse uh, where he says, uh, where there is no guidance, um, or sorry, uh, pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones, right? And that one kind of jumped out the page at me, and, and I realized I needed to work more on encouraging people. I did some more research. Um, it's been proven organizational behavior scientists, uh, people work better when they're encouraged. Um, they're more positive, uh, and if, you know, they've done studies on um, different organizations and shown that those, uh, I guess the magic number is something like five to one uh, in terms of positive to negative reinforcement. Those organizations that um, praise five times more than they criticize tend to have uh, better functioning teams. So that's one thing I worked on. Um, another one, I guess, uh, that I was already somewhat convinced of, but but Proverbs really, um, I, I guess, solidified this for me was um, team management. The importance of team management. I, you know, when you think about it, Solomon being the wisest man who ever lived, right? It's what the Bible tells us. Uh, over and over, the uh, Proverbs speaks about uh, how he's encouraging uh, getting counselors. He says, um, where there is no guidance, the people fail. Um, sorry, that's not the one. There's the one, uh, Proverbs 24, 6. Um, where he talks about uh, the importance of having many counselors and uh, in, in a number of other places as well. Iron sharpens iron, right? Uh, so here's the, the wisest person in the world, yet he's seeking counsel from an abund abundance of people. And, uh, uh, you know, he was humble enough to do that. And uh, so that has actually been a real... Um, help to me. Uh, I, I try to always get a second opinion, especially from other Christians and, um, you know, from a, a diverse group of people, because it's been shown, again, uh, through organizational behavior studies, that uh, teams are more effective than individuals. And he knew that. He says there's wisdom in a multitude of godly counsel. Right, right. So you have to be able to have uh, advisors, people who mm -hmm. are more knowledgeable. The, you know, one of the greater management tools that I learned through my career was surround yourself with people who are more knowledgeable than right. yourself. Those who who aspire to get your job, but not by undermining you, but by raising the level of the entire organization or that division, so that everybody moves up together. Uh, much like Paul wrote in uh, Ephesians, he said, Do not let any un unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. So it's, you know, corrections should be done in private, 
praise mm -hmm. should be done in public because right. it is uplifting and encouraging to the one, but also all the others who hear it, uh, <clears throat> which is why, you know, you shouldn't have any uh, public arguments. There shouldn't be any public uh, displays. Jesus talks about that in Matthew 18. If your brother offends you, go to him in private and try to win him over. Don't make it everybody's business. Keep, right. keep, you know, keep a rein on your tongue, which is great wisdom throughout, uh, throughout the Bible. Uh, f for you personally, uh, the manager that you were before you had your come to Jesus encounter and the manager you are today, yeah. how would you compare them and contrast them? Yeah, I would say uh, I'm a kinder, gentler manager, uh, to quote Mr. Bush, I guess, than, than uh, I was before. And uh, I feel a lot better about it. Uh, the book has a lot of examples about uh, things I did wrong. I've got a lot of, you know, war stories and uh, um, that I hope people will benefit from. I think I've made most of the mistakes that that can be made uh, earlier on. And, uh, uh, you know, some are quite embarrassing. Um, but uh, I think much of it, if not most of it, if, if you were to do a root cause analysis of what drove me to behave like that, I would say it's pride, you know. Um, a uh, subordinate speaks to you disrespectfully and, and uh, you know, you, you let them have it and uh, um, it's not the right way. Um, and it's because your pride's been hurt, you know. And, uh, I mean, if there's one theme that, that just comes up over and over in, in Proverbs, it, it's uh, the dangers of pride um, and the... Uh, the benefits of humility. And uh, so um, that's something that I've, yeah, I think I've improved on a lot. I hope I have. Um, I mean, it's, you know, it's always a constant battle, but uh, um, I, I think I've benefited from that advice the most. As King Solomon's life progressed, uh, he had wisdom, great wealth, and great stature, but he also had a lot of distractions. Mm. And uh, although the book of Proverbs is quite focused, uh, the life application for King Solomon, uh, he, was, he was ultimately became, uh, don't do as I do, do as I say. Right, uh, right. You know, which is also <laughs> another great lesson for all of us that it's by your actions that you're going to be measured, not by so much by your words. We're yeah. talking to John Guderian, author of the Proverbs Management Handbook, A Christian Manager's Guide to Doing Business. It takes you on a journey through the 31 chapters of the book of Proverbs and how it applies to management and how you can become a better leader by applying some of these principles. We're going to take a short break and when we come back we're going to dig into some of the practical applications and some of these war stories that John's going to share with us to show us how he was able to apply the lessons of Proverbs to become a better manager. We'll be right back. back. Shalom. I'm the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, Executive Director of Ignatica Nation and host of the daily TV program Revealing the Truth, seen live every Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Standard Time at www.ianbn.com and then replayed throughout the day and night via our website. All of our segments can be seen on the Igniting a Nation YouTube channel. Since our launch in January of this year, we've expanded our global reach to over 54 countries with a social media following of over 125,000. Our commitment is to bring you the most in-depth interviews with authors, subject matter experts, and thought leaders from around the world. We have interviewed guests from Israel, Brazil, England, India, and all across North America. All of our authors are featured on the books and media page on our website, www.inbn.com. 
There you can find a direct link to the book you want to order, and we receive a small commission directly from Amazon. There is no cost to you for this service. In addition to our daily teachings and interviews, we make available to you the archive of all of the interviews on our YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram channels. Our live program is available from our homepage, and there is never a charge to you for any of this access. We made the decision long ago that we would remain a commercial-free resource that would not be influenced by any pressure from any outside company. There are only two ways that we are able to continue to operate this ministry and provide you with the only live, four-hour daily Christian television talk show program. The first is through your support and tax-deductible contributions to Igniting a Nation. These can be made directly through the donate button on the website or sent through the mail to Igniting a Nation, 2700 Corporate Drive, Suite 120, Birmingham, Alabama, 35242. The other way we support the program is by offering you a unique opportunity to have access to over 10 years worth of teachings on a subscription basis. The teaching archives contains all of my prior sermons, Torah studies, prophecy in the news videos, and much more for the low subscription price of $5 per month. This subscription grants you unlimited access to over 800 hours of content not available elsewhere and is updated weekly with the most current prophecy classes. In addition to 20 hours of original TV programming each weekday, we invite you to join us live every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday evenings for our Prophecy in the News classes. The times and locations are listed on our events page on the website www.ianbn.com. Every day you and I are faced with the challenge of where we will go to hear the truth. We are committed to bring you the only program of its kind that covers the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. We cannot do this without your support. Since we launched on January 5, 2017, we have aired over 300 individual teachings, interviews, and commentaries not available anywhere else. We are now working side by side with almost every major Christian publishing house to bring you the most in-depth feature interviews possible. Our one-hour features address every subject that affects the believer's life. We are hearing of salvations from the Middle East, Africa, and all across the United States. Lives are being changed every day, and we have only just begun. Our mission is to become your trusted resource and grant you access to the people, tools, and information you need to grow in your relationship with the Lord. You can help us by liking us on social media and through your financial support. We know you have many choices in who you support, but we are prayerfully asking you to consider helping us keep revealing the truth, true to our calling, to cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth like no other program available. Donate today and help us bring the message to the four corners of the earth. Visit www.ianbn.com and donate, buy a book, or subscribe to our teaching archives. Without you, we do not exist. Bye. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with John Guderian, author of the Proverbs Management Handbook, A Christian Manager's Guide to Doing Business. John, welcome back to the program. Thanks. John, you alluded to uh, some interesting war stories. We all, we all have them. Uh, those moments in our careers where we look back and we reflect on how we handled a situation and with added wisdom and knowledge, we probably would have done it differently. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, think of one of those situations that you can reflect back on that uh, how, you, how you handled it uh, then, how you would handle it now, and what benefit do you think you might uh, receive or have received differently than the outcome that you did receive? Yeah. Um, boy, there's so many. Um, but uh, maybe I can give you a couple. Um, early in my career, I was, uh, you know, very focused on, on making money. And um, 
I talked about that a little bit earlier, how uh, my priorities were, you know, somewhat messed up. Um, and uh, yeah, one particular, you know, Solomon talks about the dangers of greed, right? Um, and uh, that message had not quite sunk in yet, but uh, I was at the point where, um, and this was early on, the internet was a relatively new thing, but I already had a stock ticker, you know, running across the bottom of my screen at work and calling my broker several times a day, you know, day trading um, and uh, leveraging investments, doing really stupid things. And um, remember at one point um, having uh, made a ton of money on on a leveraged investment and uh, then selling that stock um, prematurely. It, it had I held on to it another week, I would have uh, I would have made an, I, close to a hundred thousand dollars extra. I think uh, as it was, I made about twenty. And um, so, but rather than being you know grateful for having made. $20,000 for doing absolutely nothing, I literally lost like three nights sleep fretting over, oh, I wish I would have, you know, held on to this um, stock a little bit longer. And uh, that was a, a bit of an epiphany for me in terms of uh, there's no end to greed and, and, and you can become a slave to it, right? And again, uh, throughout the book of uh, Proverbs, uh, Solomon talks about... Uh, uh, the dangers of that. Well, in a capitalistic organization, such as most companies are, the return on shareholder investment is always a driving factor. Profits are mm -hmm. always a driving factor. Right. How do you balance then with keeping it uh, in balance? Uh, how do the Proverbs help you find that balance? It's one thing to make a statement, greed's not good. Right. Sure. We, we can agree greed's not good. That's, yeah. a, that's a principle. Uh, don't be greedy. That's a principle. But how do we apply that in business and still yet set goals, milestones, encourage people to obtain more success without being greedy? I, I think, I mean, the one aspect to that is certainly um, you want to look for win-win situations, right? You don't want to take the whole pie for yourself. Uh, Stephen Covey, uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, has written a, you know, a, a very good book on that. And uh, just always looking for that win-win situation that, that's going to be mutually beneficial for your suppliers, your customers, and yourself. Um, and... Uh, um, I, I guess the, and, and, and your employees as well, you know, sharing the wealth in the end, there's blessings that result from that style of management. When, when your suppliers are making profit, they're able to supply you better quality product. Uh, they don't have to cut everything to the bone. Uh, when your employees are being fairly paid, um, you know, they're going to work a little bit harder. They're certainly going to be a little more loyal. You're going to have a more stable workforce. Um, and all these things, again, are, are, are things that uh, Solomon advocates. Which, which proverb, as uh, is, is you look over your career, your management, your results uh, in applying some of these principles, which proverb jumps into your recollection as being the one that you could actually see play out where here's the principle of the proverb and here's how I was able to apply it and here's the result I got from it because yeah. I'm looking at this Proverbs management handbook and I want to be able to glean from it you know how do I apply these scriptures I'm excited mm. now I'm, I'm excited about the Proverbs and using biblical truth in my management but what kind of results? Yeah. What am I going to gain from this other than applying biblical principles? Can it, can it really work? Yeah, fair enough. Um, and, and that's an easy one for me because uh, I'll tell everybody my password for my computer. It's PR246. 
Proverbs 24, 6, for waging war, you need guidance, for victory, many advisors. I repeat that to myself every time I log on to my computer. And uh, I'm going to have to change it now, I guess. <laughs> but um, In any case, um, I'm an introvert. Um, you know, I've, I've fallen into most management positions. I, I, I was competent in, in what I did because I had a lot of experience, you know, having worked, grown up in, in a family business and that sort of thing. So I always got promoted uh, without having had a lot of management training. And, uh, you know, being somewhat introverted and, um, I, you know, I like doing things on my own. You know, that, that's my natural tendency is to, is to just tackle the project on my own. But uh, when I found out this was, a, a, you know, a guiding principle, I, I made a real effort to apply it. And I cannot remember the last big decision I've made on my own. You know, I have made it a habit now to seek counselors. And, and to put together cross-functional teams um, with diverse opinions. I always make, I, I try to make sure I've got somebody on that team that completely disagrees with me, you know, because you want, you want to have a bit of conflict in a team, right? And um, like iron sharpens iron. Um, you know, there's a little friction implied there, right? And that's a good thing if it's constructive. Um, so uh, I would say since I've started doing that, um, I've made much better business decisions. And I've become a very, very strong believer in team management. And I encourage my subordinates, you know, to, to create their own teams at the low, lower levels as well, um, because teams do make better decisions if they're diverse. I mean, if they're all, you know, group think and equally in my, they're, they're, they're all thinking the same. Well, then you only need one of them. But, but you, want, you want people with diverse opinions. You want a bit of conflict um, and uh, constructive conflict, though, friendly conflict, uh, where everybody leaves um, still liking each other. You know, King Solomon wrote this about 3,000 years ago. And these, yeah. these principles still apply today. Uh, you talk about team building, you talk about wisdom in a multitude of godly counsel. Uh, there's a certain level of integrity that, uh, and, and priorities that King Solomon lays out. And I think Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 really kind of sets the standard that you have to trust in the Lord and lean not on your own understanding. And in all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. That's quite a, uh, uh, a banner mm -hmm. to place over oneself that you're going to truly trust in the Lord. And our understanding is so limited. His understanding is so great. Mm -hmm. How do we put that into practice in the workplace and instill vision casting and instill trust into our organizations yeah well i mean we've got to model good behavior i think that's that's a, a start um but uh I, let me diverge just a little bit because um in, you were asking for some stories uh along the same line you know trusting in the lord uh, we don't always have the right answers um and uh you know, sometimes we just have no idea how to tackle a problem. And I think when we when we put our trust in God and, and our motives are good, um, you know, a, a large part of the book deals with building a righteous organization, right? Uh, uh, something based on, on biblical principles and then adhering to those principles. And, and the result of that is enormous blessings. And, um, you know, it's a little bit different, but I cover it in the book. Um, you know, there's going to be the odd time where uh, you run into a situation where you haven't got a clue what to do. And uh, what the biggest uh, um, story I have on that was I had a, a former employee <laughs> once who 
Uh, he was a rough guy. He was a really rough guy. His password for his computer was 666. Back then, you could have shorter passwords. And he's allowed me to share this story. Um, anyway, uh, he uh, left the organization and uh, got into drugs and um, ended up uh, addicted to all kinds of crazy things and, and lost everything. Uh, uh, on drug binges, had to sell his house and all that, and you know, suicide attempt. And anyway, so I was at a actually a Promise Keeper conference um, the one time, and they asked us to um, think of an individual that really needed God. And immediately his name came to mind. And what we were supposed to do was to give them this uh, leave no man behind dog tag. Okay. And I hadn't seen this guy for years, and, and I, I, uh, I was very, very nervous. I, I had no idea what to say uh, to him. He was not a Christian, uh, but I called him up. It took a long time, and, and I was able to eventually track him down. And, and uh, I prayed. I fasted, and I prayed before talking to him. And my words just seemed incoherent and disorganized and lame. Uh, and I thought this did not work out well at all. But I said, Hey, you know, I've got these dog tags that I'd like to give you and I'd like to pray with you. And it turned out he was in a rehab center. And I went there. And um, just a bunch of guys that had just got out of jail. And, you know, I felt like so out of place. But I again, prayed for the words. And um, I gave it to him. And it was a very awkward sort of thing. But it must have been the right words. Because uh, he then asked if he could come to church with me, and long story short, uh, accepted Jesus, and and uh, uh, I went back uh, for his graduation from the rehab, and he had actually purchased a bag full of these uh, leave no man behind tags, and all these rough guys that had just gotten out of jail were all wearing them, and he's he's started a ministry um, for. Uh, um, people on drugs. And um, anyway, my point is being that um, God gives us the right words. God guides us when we ask for his guidance. And yeah, we're not always going to have, it's not always going to seem like the right words, but somehow it sits, hits a chord if he wants it to with the people that we're talking to, right? So th this trust in God led you to minister to someone that really was uh, uh, a bit of a conflict for you in the work environment. Uh, so it actually took this introvert and made you a little bit more evangelical, uh, willing to intercede and, and be more passionate about your work for the Lord. Uh, Absolutely. There's practical tips that you give in the book uh, in, in regards to quality assurance and sales and marketing and mm. every part of the organization. Uh, you know, most people negotiate to win. Mm. Uh, how, how, uh, how do the Proverbs impact negotiating? Negotiating with vendors, negotiating with customers, negotiating with coworkers or uh, managers or employees. Yeah, uh, there's a number of verses uh, where Proverbs tells us to use honest scales. God detests dishonest scales, right? And um, I think the meaning of that is pretty clear. You know, first of all, we negotiate honestly, um, but again, I think. Um, the approach that that also implies is um, that our negotiations be mutually beneficial, that they be win-win. And there's benefits to that because if your supplier is doing well, I mean, you don't want to be gouged and, you know, you've got to be wise and prudent and knowledgeable about, you know, what prices are and that kind of thing and go out for multiple quotes. But, um, but 
you want your pro you want your supplier to make a profit too because it's hard finding good suppliers right you want him to keep being in business and uh as his business grows with your business, there's going to be more economies of scale, um, and he'll be able to lower his prices eventually. So again, win-win is is what you're after in in all of these situations. You know, I spent a good part of my management career as a national sales manager uh, with AT&T, oh, okay. uh, and Northern Telecom was a direct competitor, but right. yet. Uh, we sold them switches uh, because we had the best technology and we used some of their switches uh, because of their technology. So mm. in one realm on the streets we competed but in the infrastructure we supplied. Right. And so it was that love-hate relationship where you tried to maintain uh, a balance. Of course Northern Telecom was a Canadian uh, t telecom manufacturer now purchased, I believe, by maybe Siemens or someone else. I don't think they're they're it, around. No, they're not around. They've, yeah, you're right. It's been divvied up. Uh, Rim, um, who's now BlackBerry, took a lot of their people and some of their technology. And yeah. So it's it's very interesting that that this. Uh, you're right that uh, a false balance is an abomination to God. Right. Uh, using a different set of weights, scales, and measurements for other people, which you know brings about diversity issues. It brings about how do we manage diversity, uh, how do we accept diversity. But this is also a book which you say is a Christian manager's guide to doing business. Mm. Uh, what are some of the Christian New Testament teachings of Jesus, teaching of Paul, cross applications and confirmation of the Proverbs that play out in the New Testament where we see that the teaching of Jesus do align well or are they, uh, in the teachings of Paul, are they as wise or touted as the same brand of wisdom? Do they expand upon the teachings of King Solomon? How does it line up for the New Testament believer? Yeah, I mean, I... I I don't see any inconsistencies, certainly, but uh, the one that jumps out at me, of course, is um, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, right? And I think that's a very consistent theme throughout Proverbs. You know, nowhere does it say get rich on the back of others, right? Uh, he seems to have been a very compassionate manager um, and... Uh, you know, very concerned about his um, subordinates. As you study the Proverbs and your management style changed, as you began to apply the principle of Proverbs and saw the direct benefit, uh, do you give copies of this to managers? Do you suggest that managers, senior management, gets copies of this book to put in the hands of managers? And what can they expect that if they do that, what kind of results do you think they might see? Yeah, um, we're actually, uh, I don't know if I mentioned it earlier, but um, on this 48 state book tour that we're doing currently, uh, we were not able to get the visa that would allow us to sell the books in the US, uh, which has actually turned out to be a great blessing because it's a lot of work setting up book signings and that kind of stuff. Um, so what we're doing is uh, we're praying every morning that God will put the right people in our path and um, that we can just give a book or two books or however many books um, to people that will benefit from them. And certainly if any of your readers are interested, if they're businessmen or any of your viewers rather, uh, you know, feel free to contact me. I'd, I'd love to give you a free copy because what I'm actually finding is that um, once a businessman reads this, um, a Christian businessman, uh, he typically ends up buying 20, 30, 40. One guy's bought 141 <laughs> copies to give to his friends and his associates. And so uh, to answer your original question, yes, I, I, um, I give them to my subordinates. Um, uh, the ones that aren't Christians, um, I haven't pushed it on them. I haven't mandated that they follow any of this. 
uh, most of them have asked for a copy and then I'll, I'll give it to them. Uh, they know my management style. They know I'm a Christian and they, they have a pretty good idea what's going to be in the book. And, um, so, but yeah, our, our company, um, it is based on biblical values. It was founded by a Christian, half the senior management team are Christians. And, um, so we, we try to manage according to Christian principles and, and, uh, uh, most of this is things that we already do. And so it, it's actually, uh, for the senior people, probably not even that helpful because it's already stuff that, that we're doing that they know from having studied Proverbs on their own. So is this something that uh, you would think for uh, so many three, four, five years out of college that's now moving up through the ranks to learn the foundational principles to help them shape the vision for what kind of manager they want to be. Uh, be begin planning now. I think preparation was a big part of King Solomon's message uh, was to be prepared to absolutely to, to study uh, this if you wanted the benefit of the great wisdom that he was given. You mentioned pride at the opening of the show and the correlation between the wisest man and the wisest angel, uh, the, the, the parallels are right there, that what you can do with the same amount of wisdom. Uh, Satan was the most beautiful and the wisest of all the angels. Yeah. We talk about the beauty and the richness of King Solomon and the great wisdom and that pride comes before the fall and a haughty spirit before destruction. Uh, these are attributes of, uh, we see it in, even in these scandals that are happening now, the people that were most vocal about, uh, you know, not having uh, extramarital relations are now coming out being accused of, of having. So you, you can't speak with a, with a uh, you can't be double-minded. Uh, right. in, in anything that you do. We've been talking with John Guderian, author of the Proverbs Management Handbook, A Christian Manager's Guide to Doing Business. <clears throat> uh, this is going to provide guidance on strategy and leadership, conflict management and teamwork, self-improvement, communication, hiring and firing, rewards and recognition, sales and marketing, purchasing and finance, how to negotiate, how to be a better manager, using the application of the wisdom of King Solomon found in the 31 chapters of the book of Proverbs. John Guderian, we thank you for sharing this great resource with us here on Revealing the Truth, and uh, I encourage our audience to visit your blog and website. It's John A. Guderian, G-U-D-E-R-I-A-N.com. Uh, for more information on how to reach John. We wish you great success. Enjoy your journey here through the colonies uh, as uh, you get familiar with the 48 states, contiguous United States, uh, wonderful people uh, all over the place ready to welcome you and uh, bless you. So thank you for sharing this with us here on Revealing the Truth. Okay, thank you very much for having me. You're welcome. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.